Father, we come to you this morning to confess our sins that we have committed. Some we have committed through our tongues unintentionally. Lord, give us bravery to be honest in confession, to hide nothing, but to confess fully, clearly, so that, Lord, your power can be able to loosen the bonds of sins over us. In your word, Lord, you said, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all the righteous un unrighteousness. Heavenly Father, help to confess <coughs> the sins. Your word tells us whoever hides the sins will not be successful, but whoever confess their sins and stop doing wrong will receive mercy. Lord, help us to deny ourselves and take up the cross to follow Jesus. We give up the right to live by our own rules. Lord, we give up the right to put ourselves first. Dear God, help us to walk in the light as he is in the light. Hear our cry, Lord, we need your mercy. We need your grace today. Hear us, Lord, as we pray. See our hearts, Lord. Remove anything that is standing in the way of coming to you, Lord, today. Our souls are thirsty for you, Lord, as we will have a communion and a baptism services. Lord, help us to reflect faith on our hearts and the sacrifice of Christ. Help us, Lord, to seek deeper, closer, and more constant with you through prayer. Lord, help us, our mouth, not to depart from your word. Help us to meditate the word of the Lord day and night. We trust you, Lord. You are so faithful in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for your endless love and mercy. Amen. Morning, everyone. A reading is taken from Mark 2, reading from verse 1 to 12. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they had thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Apologies, the text wasn't up on the screen. I forgot to put it in the service. But it's a remarkable story, isn't it? 
Which is easier to do, to say to a lame man, take up your mat and walk, or your sins are forgiven? It is a puzzling question at the heart of a fascinating story. It reminds me of what I heard from one pastor as he led a wedding, reminding the couple of what are the most important words in marriage. Do you know the most important words in marriage? Do you? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Or perhaps more fully, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. And the response, the right response in that situation would be, yes, of course you were wrong. <laughs> no, that would be too easy. <laughs> I forgive you, I forgive you. But which is easier, to ask forgiveness or to receive it, to raise the lame, or forgive. The words seem so simple, and yet, how hard and challenging it is. As we consider this subject of forgiveness in a brief moment this morning, I wonder who you're thinking of as we sit here, where there's been some breakdown, or lack of forgiveness, or ongoing unforgiveness. Is it a family member you've had a fallout with? Perhaps an ex-husband or wife, a colleague, a, a once good friend. It may even be someone in the church. Maybe even struggling, to use the world's phrase, it's not really a biblical idea, to forgive yourself. I think really what that's about is accepting the forgiveness that God gives. And you're heartbroken and devastated and wondering if you can ever move on from the bitterness and hurt you may be experiencing this morning. Maybe wondering if they can ever forgive you for what you've done. Or you yourself are just too hurt to even want to move towards the person in forgiveness. In fact, you don't want to forgive them. You want the worst for them. Now, this remarkable story this morning is an account of somebody who clearly wasn't seeking forgiveness. It wasn't on his agenda. It wasn't at the forefront of his mind as he and his friends made plans to, to get Jesus' attention in a rather dramatic way. His need was, at least outwardly, a whole lot more obvious. He needed healing. He wanted to walk again, to run, to dance. And it's an audacious, desperate plan to get to the man everyone wanted to see, everyone wanted a piece of. And perhaps they tried and failed a few times before. And this was their boldest ploy yet, and they were determined to make it work. In fact, the text tells us they were driven by faith. Trust that Jesus would do something, could help them. And determined desperation does interesting things to human beings, doesn't it? It sometimes creates disregard for other things and obstacles and challenges. And so I imagine that the owner of the house that day would not have been jumping for joy as he saw parts of his roof dismantled and suddenly remodeled into a crude skylight. Now granted, with the pressed clay and straw and wooden beams of those days, it wasn't a difficult task to do that, but it would have taken some time to create a stretcher-sized hole and some care to not allow too much debris to fall down on amazed, open-mouthed spectators below who might quickly close their mouths. And it could all go horribly wrong, not least of all their coordinating of their ropes as they four lowered their helpless friend down, careful not to overbalance him off the edge of his mat and end up compounding his paralysis problem. But it's obvious, isn't it, to all why he is there? Obvious to all except, apparently, Jesus. As ever, Jesus confounds us and will not be put in a box. Listen to how he responds to what he sees as this man is lowered before him. Verse 5 of Mark chapter 2. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now how determined and desperate faith from these men must have in that moment threatened to deflate and turn to disappointment as they heard those words from Jesus. What are you on about, Jesus? Why are you talking about sin? Is Jesus saying this man's own personal sin caused his paralysis? Possibly, but we know that Jesus on a number of occasions cautioned his disciples to not jump to such conclusions. Was this man 
blind because of his own sin or his parents? And Jesus says, no, neither. It's part of the fallen world. These things happen. I don't think that's the point he's making here, that this man's paralysis was due to his own personal sin. No, what is Jesus doing? I think here in the midst of the clamor of the miracle and the deliverance and the healing and the party trick they want and taking a... He takes this critical, all eyes on him moment to tell us what really matters. To tell us what he has come to do and to show us why he is the only one qualified to do it. Jesus' priority is not healing the body, it's healing the heart. Jesus' priority is forgiveness. Now why, you might ask, is this such a big deal to Jesus? Well, in order to understand that, we need to understand why Jesus is such a big deal and why sin is such a big deal. Why this is center stage on Jesus' lips and actions here. We need to understand first what he is forgiving us from. We need to understand the big deal about sin, you see. Forgiveness matters because sin matters, and it is an unsolvable human problem. You can't scrub it away with any version of shower gel. You can't wring it clean, you can't mask it, you can't medicate it, you can't vaccinate it. You can't reason it away or wish it away. You can't cover it in good deeds or hide it. You can't outrun it, you can't undo it. You can't pay its penance enough or bribe it away. You can't church it, baptize it or confirm it. It cannot be tamed or ignored. You can't kill it. In fact, it kills you. See, we make two deadly errors when we think about sin. We think sin, if we even call it that, because it's a word that's gone out of our vocabulary. I think it's still in the dictionary. We think sin is applied only to the really bad people in this world, the murderers, the pedophiles, the rapists, and maybe the politicians. Apologies to any politicians here. It's just a joke. And we think if there is a hell, it's meant for them. Or if we do concede maybe that we are sinful, then it's just a magnum ice cream. It's a little overindulgence. It's some naughty fun, or it's a bit of a silly mistake at best. We are only human after all, as we love to say. It certainly doesn't figure large in our vocabulary or our lives. I mean, let's not be prudish or judgmental or uncool or intolerant and spoil everybody's fun by talking so much about sin. That's the one big mistake we make. The other big mistake we make is thinking we can deal with it ourselves. We can deal with our bad things or our guilt or our mistakes or wrongdoings by just making sure we tip the scales enough in the direction of our good deeds. See, I'm not a bad person. I do a lot of good. I love others. I give to the church. I serve on the leadership committee. Just wait until you see what I'm going to give to Harvest. Please don't tell me. <laughs> I keep the Ten Commandments, most of them. I'm religious. I don't miss a communion. I read my Bible. I pray. We make the mistake of thinking as long as our good works outweigh our bad, we're okay. And we're okay with God. And we'll be accepted by Him in the end. Both mistakes, friends, are rooted in thinking we are much better than we are. And God is much less holy than he is. In other words, that God is less than God. We you prayed, we've been reminded of his holiness. By contrast, the only man who never sinned had a very different view of sin. He considered it serious, damaging, and even deadly. Have a listen to what he said a little later on in Mark's Gospel. Mark chapter 7, verse 14. He called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. 
For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within, then they defile the person. Did you see yourself in the list? It's easy to miss it. You may not think, well, I haven't murdered, I haven't maybe stolen or committed adultery, but did you notice pride is there? Slander, foolishness, envy. In other words, Jesus is saying we are all unclean before God. No matter how much or little sin we think we've done, our hearts are sin sick. We are unclean on the inside. And we are defiled before God, all of us. And then look at Jesus' words a little later on in chapter 9, they're even stronger. Verse 42, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. Imagine we took Jesus literally. Would we barely be sitting on these seats because there'd be body parts falling off all over the place? We would look grotesque. But that's just the point that Jesus is making. Sin is grotesque. Sin ruins. Sin damages. In fact, sin takes us on the path to death. We all deserve hell. Every single one of us, Jesus is saying to us, we do not deserve to be in his presence forever. We have all turned our backs on him because sin is a problem of the heart. The heart of the problem is a problem of our hearts. We aren't a sinner because we sin and do sinful things. We sin because we are sinners at heart. Because the essence of sin is the rejection of God in the world he has made. Failing to honor God as God. In fact, make ourselves God. Put ourselves in his place. And the Bible tells us unequivocally, we have all done that. And we all deserve separation from him for eternity. That's how seriously Jesus takes it. He speaks so clearly of these things. He shows us clearly that that is the paralytic's greatest problem. It's his friend's greatest problem. It's the Pharisee's greatest problem. It's your greatest problem and it's my greatest problem. That's why it's his priority here in the midst of these crowds who clamor for their miracle. The miracle you and I need most is to have our hearts cleansed and to be forgiven. For we are all sinners destined for hell and we are all sinners in need of forgiveness. And we are doomed if God himself does not act to make that possible. Do you believe that? I thought we were coming for a nice baptism. It's nice to look at babies. And here the pastor's saying these hard things, but these are not my things, friends. It is God's word that you need to hear clearly today and understand your peril if you do not reach out for God's solution. And gloriously and wondrously, he has provided it. You see, I talked about sin as the great unsolvable human problem. It is. But then one came who was not merely human. He was fully human, yes. But he was more than that. You see, the big deal about Jesus, and he shows us this here, doesn't he? Is that he is more than just some ordinary human being, some teacher. But we are all in need of what he offers, whether you're the outwardly respectable, self-righteous rebel or the profligate rebel. And that changes how we see each other, doesn't it? It changes how we treat each other too, as we'll see in just a moment. But let's move on from all the doom and gloom. It's not the end of the story yet. It's not the end of our story. For what happens next to the man on the mat? Let's read again from verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. He's claiming to be God. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They know their Bibles. They know their Old Testaments. Only God can forgive. 
And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that this they questioned within themselves, he said, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, take your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man, that's Jesus' way of referring to himself, has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said, I say to you, rise, take up your bed and go home. And he rose. It's amazing, isn't it? What's just happened here? Our friend got a two-for-one deal. Not just functional legs, but a forgiven life. Not just healing, but hope. From a very nice man. A good moral teacher with a few magic tricks up his sleeve, right? Yes, the writers embellished the account to add a bit of drama and all. They did that a lot on every page of the Gospels, really. Did they? Did they? Is he just that moral teacher? Of course, the alternative is that he really is a blasphemer. Not a good man, but a bad man. Claiming to be someone he's not. And he seems to do that a lot, too. The Pharisees know their Old Testaments, as I said. Only God can forgive sins. Who does he think he is? This is the height of blasphemy, of course. If you are just a good teacher... You can't be that. You'd be a liar and a hypocrite. So take your pick. Which Jesus do you want? There's many out there in our world. I think the paralytic wanted only one Jesus that day. And he got even more than he bargained for. He got the Jesus who is the man God. Fully God and fully man. He got the Jesus not just merely a good moral teacher, As many other eloquent writers have said, Jesus is either mad, or is bad, or is God. There are no other options. And Jesus here demonstrates just who he is. Without even having to say the words himself, Jesus goes on to demonstrate that he just is who he says he is. Verse 10 again. But that you may know that the Son of Man, the second person of the Trinity, has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise up, take up your bed and go home. Jesus demonstrates his claim to be God, to be the one who is able to forgive sins. He's saying, here I am. I know only God can forgive sins. That's why I am doing it. For I alone can. And dear friend, if you take the scripture seriously today, you can't make Jesus any less than that, though you may be tempted to. Because we want a Jesus we can control. We want a Jesus made in our own image because we don't want to bow to Jesus as Lord. We want to live our lives the way we want to. And we'll have a little bit of Jesus on the side. And I'll come to church and do my thing there. And I'll read my Bible occasionally. And of course I'll call to God when there's trouble. I believe in him. But do you really? Do you believe his son's demand to have all of you? And that he made it possible by laying his life down for you. That you may have all of him. It's that great little story of the boy, the two boys running to their dad and the one gets there sooner than the other and says, I've got all of daddy. And the other little boy, a little bit later on, comes and then he gets there and he scrunches himself in and he puts Daddy's arms around him and he says, yes, but Daddy's got all of me. Has he got all of you? Do you see the implications of these words? This scripture expresses who he is. He's a big deal. He is the king of the universe and why he came. Do you see that this miracle expresses the heart of the purpose of Jesus' mission? He came on a rescue mission to save us from sin. And how did he do it? How can I be sure I'm accepted by this God and not cast away? How can I know I will receive the forgiveness of the one who matters most, that my life will be changed forever, including my relationships with others and how I view them and how I move towards them in forgiveness? For if he has cancelled such a great debt of mine, Surely I cannot stand in unforgiveness and bitterness towards others. I have no right. The gospel has stripped me of those rights. Yes, I'm not saying it's easy. Do you think it was easy for Jesus to die for you? Your forgiveness cost him. It cost him his life. And you know, Christian friend, that when you forgive because God has forgiven you, it costs you too. 
because you absorb the hurt, but Christ paid for it. You see how we see others differently? Because of the cross. Can you trust him who made it possible by paying for your sin on the cross? The very reason he came, to bring you near to God, to reunite you with the Father, that you may spend an eternity with him. And now in the light of that eternity and that life which you've received at the cross, forgiveness, that Romans 8 passage which Hannes read, that nothing can separate you from that love because that's his covenant commitment to you. And it's sealed in blood. And he will not take it back if you come to him as these men did in faith and acknowledgement of your sin. You receive his grace and his life. And it will change you forever. It changes everything. Jesus said that's why he came. This last verse as I close. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Are you among the many? You can only be. If you have acknowledged your sin, repented of it and drawn near to him for life, who alone can forgive you. It's glorious good news, isn't it? It's astonishing that he would do such a thing for you and me who do not deserve it. That's where we start. I am undeserving. We humble ourselves before the cross and we take his hand and know that his day has got all of us. If you would just trust him. You might be asking the questions of, well then what does that mean for my forgiveness and my relationships with others? I know you'll work some of these things through. I had another half of the sermon to tell you, but that's not going to come now. We'll do that in this series going forward. But take a hold, friends, of this magnificent news. We've seen it pictured in baptism. We're going to see it now pictured in communion. The blood of Jesus shed for us and his body broken for us. You are all welcome to come to this table if you love Jesus. You don't need to be a member of this church. It's a magnificent and glorious thing to take these things and have them laced before us month in and month out and be reminded that the heart of the universe is a slain lamb for you, for your sake, for your life. And today could be the most significant day, not because you attended a baptism or a communion service, but because you gave your life to this Christ. And you'll be changed for all eternity. Tim Keller said these words. I'll leave this with you and we'll come to the communion table. No created thing can satisfy your heart if you get it. Or forgive your sins if you fail it. Jesus is the only Lord who, if you receive him, will fulfill you completely. And if you fail him, will forgive you eternally. Is that not good news to you today? Let's bow our heads. Let's just be silent as we draw near to the table. And then I'll ask you to join with me in a prayer of humble access as we come to the table. But let's just be silent for a moment. Oh God, oh God, we are astonished. For at the heart of your forgiveness is your love for us and your redeeming grace. Say nothing but thank you for what you've done. Thank you for not leaving us to ourselves. Thank you for solving that which we could not. Help us to live life with a big God and a small us. And yet to see if we know and acknowledge this triune God and all that he is and all his glory, you will exalt us. 
It's astonishing, Lord. We are not worthy. And we say now these words together as we come to the table. Will you join with me? These words of this prayer will be up on the screen. Prayer of humble access. Merciful Lord, we do not dare to come to your table trusting in our own righteousness, but only in your great mercy. We are not fit to gather up the crumbs under your table, but it is always your delight to show mercy. And grant, therefore, that as we eat this bread and drink this wine, we may by faith partake spiritually of the body and blood of your dear Son, Jesus Christ our Saviour, and thus express our union with him and he with us. Amen. Yes, mercy is Lord.